there it is. Okay, there you go. Okay, I see some familiar names, or at least one familiar name. Mark, Hi. I think uh, I think you signed on uh, just this just this evening, correct? I did. I, rec I recognize your last name. Good for you. That's great. I'm glad you're with us. Um, that's terrific. Okay, so Hi, Mark. Hi. we we are going to go ahead and get started, and you know we start with some introductions, and so it's uh, if people will have a chance to join us if they're just logging on and won't miss really critical information. Um, and we'll be able to uh, follow up. This will be recorded, as I've been saying, if you joined us a little early, we were talking about recording. Um, first of all, welcome one and all to Ashbrook School. Uh, if you're here for our Exploring Preschool, Pre-K and Grades K through four discussion panel, you are in the right place. Um, thanks for being with us for about the next hour or so, for trusting us with your time. If you have questions while we're presenting, please jot them down in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation or we'll email you answers if we run out of time. And as I uh, started to say earlier, this will be recorded. If you'd like a recording sent to you, we can do that. If you know other people who couldn't be here tonight who might also like a recording, we can make sure that that happens as well. My name is Dr. Chris Schobel, and it's my pleasure to have the best job in the world uh, as Ashbrook's head of school, and I'll be your MC for this evening's panel discussion. Unfortunately, uh, my partner in crime, Rachel Seckler, cannot be here because of a COVID-related family situation that she's taken care of. Um, so I'm going to try to hold it together without my assistant head of school. Rachel usually says she's got the second best job in the world. We'll spend uh, about 10 minutes with some background information about Ashbrook, and then we'll spend the majority of our time uh, in discussion with our teacher experts, addressing a variety of questions, and then we'll leave time for Q&A. Again, uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. It, uh, if you feel strongly that um, it's a question that we should respond to in real time, we could do that too. Just put, uh, you know, raise your hand or, um, physically or through the, uh, the response button that you have. Um, but we'll make sure again that we'll get to those questions uh, if they're urgent or we'll wait until the end, but we'll definitely email you answers back if we don't get to them. Uh, this is gonna take us till about 7.30 and uh, we've reserved an additional 30 minutes following this for a tour that I can give virtually. I'll walk around with my laptop and um, I've asked for all the lights to be kept on, which I didn't do last time, which was, um, a, little, a little scary trying to turn the lights on in the building holding my laptop. I'm not sure it inspired a lot of confidence, but um, this time I'm assured that the lights have been kept on um, this time of the year. That's essential. So if you want to stick around for a virtual tour, we can we can do that as well. Uh, first of all, a bit of background about Ashbrook Independent School. In 1993, Dave and Cecilia Gore uh, founded the school. Um, am I sharing my screen with you right now, by the way? Can you see my screen? Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, David Cecilia started by defining uh, the educational criteria they were seeking for their two youngest children. The features they sought included a well-rounded, full curriculum, a flexible and vibrant arts program, advanced science and mathematics courses, uh, history, uh, taught to show cause and effect, uh, early introduction of foreign languages, small class sizes, a strong monthly themed character education program, and uh, challenging and nurturing teachers. They soon realized that this program, such a program like this, was not available locally, so they decided to create their dream school in Corvallis. They found a 12 and a half acre parcel adjoining Starker Arts Park and their dream was born. Dave himself designed our purpose-built campus to support the academic program and that he and Cecilia envisioned. Uh, there is a peacefulness to the space, a sacredness even, but also a strong sense of playfulness. Uh, community and joy pervade every corner of the campus. Uh, the place really is a work of art, and those visiting it will have zero doubt that 
aesthetics were an important part of this uh, for the Gores uh, as they worked to create a space that just by its thoughtfulness of the design signaled the high value they placed on education. Around every corner, it's clear that the design principles were aimed at creating a space that is inviting and that warmly welcomes all visitors. Uh, in addition, Dave really wanted every teacher to have a premier space for teaching. That was super important to him. Uh, the building is bright and airy. Uh, it brings in the outside in, and it's a great resource for our teachers as they work to challenge and nurture their students. Values that are deeply embedded in our school's mission. Our classrooms are warm and inviting. Uh, they're beautifully designed to be appealing to the eye, but they're super functional uh, for a group of students and their teacher. Students have plenty of space uh, in the room, shelves upon shelves of books and supplies at their fingertips and bulletin boards designed to engage and provide uh, resources readily available for students to access. I'm wondering, uh, you guys do such a great job, just a little aside here with bulletin boards. I am super impressed with your bulletin boards. Um, do you guys, does that just come naturally? Or do you guys study that as you as you work towards certification? I'm serious. Is there like a bulletin board? It's amazing the job that you guys do. Um, I tried to create a bulletin board the other day and I was just reminded of how tough it is and, and reminded of how beautiful a job you guys typically do on that. So, Well, the children usually create mine. So I just keep putting a lot of their work up and it just blossoms. Oh, that's good to know. Good. Well, maybe that's what I need. I need some of your kids to help me out. <laughs> I'm going to come. I'm going to come and get them next time I try to do that. Um, so combined with excellent teachers and a challenging and nurturing curriculum, a strong character education program, wonderfully vibrant and exciting arts curriculum and an array of electives second to none uh, in our in our upper school. The student experience is one of excitement, growth, and inspiration, and our students often express regret that Friday has come so quickly. That's That was amazing to me when I first came here and I heard kids getting in their car on Fridays, being a little bummed out that they didn't have school the next day. Uh, that was not my experience as a student. On top of all this, we have very small class sizes, uh, lower school caps at 18 and beginning school caps at 16. Uh, Students are well known because of this uh, by their teachers and are given differentiated instruction on a daily basis. Uh, of course, we are guided in all we do by our school mission. Uh, students at Ashbrook are challenged and nurtured and invited to seek and embrace growth, growth challenges. For example, students who are uh, in their comfort zone as readers may be invited to push themselves a bit more as mathematicians or writers or vice versa. A word about what we mean by academically capable, right? Our mission is to challenge and nurture academically capable students. So it's important to talk for a couple of minutes about what we mean by academically capable because um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. Uh, our founders, uh, you know, seldom in, in this world do you have a chance to speak to the founders of an institution, but Cecilia and, and Dave are uh, not only very willing to talk, they're members of, of the board um, and are still heavily involved in uh, the guidance of the school. Our, our founders have talked about, when you hear them talk about academically capable, they talk about behaviors that a student brings to the classroom that allow them and others to learn. It's not about aptitude, it's more about attitude. It's not about IQ, it's more about a willingness to bring persistence, effort, and motivation to one's learning. It really is habits of mind and behaviors. That, uh, that allow a teacher to teach and not have to uh, corral discipline issues, not have to worry about um, taking time out of uh, teaching and learning to address kids who just are not interested in learning. And, and of course, you know, this happens from time to time um, in, in a lot of schools. I have uh, yet to see a kid who walks through the door at Ashbrook who is not hungry to learn and in fact gets a little uh, a little, what's the word I'd use, um, disappointed if one, of their, if one of their classmates seems to be slightly distracted and the teacher does from time to time need to call a kid back into focus. So uh, it's not tolerated by teachers, it's not tolerated by students, um, which is not to say we uh, don't understand normative developmental 
uh, behavioral issues. We certainly do. Uh, we're not looking for what uh, have been called step for children. We're looking for children who are uh, come to us with a joy of, for learning and uh, an inclination to uh, enter into a classroom with an eagerness and a curiosity to, uh, to, to grow and give themselves growth challenges and accept growth challenges and, uh, and move on through the curriculum in that way. So please reach out to me uh, or anyone else you meet uh, during tonight's discussion, and we'd be happy to make time to tell you more about our awesome school. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to allow our panelists to respond to a few questions. Uh, panelists, are you ready? Sure. Yep. Okay. I, Kim, I see Kim has joined us, which is great. Um, so panelists, please introduce yourselves as you answer the first question. Give us your name how long you've been at Ashbrook and what you do at Ashbrook. So this first question is a little bit of a softball. It's for each of you. Why do you teach at Ashbrook? I'm Vicki Wheatley. I'm the pre-kindergarten teacher. Um, I've been with the school for 25 years and it just we, keeps getting- We built the school, we built the school around Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was being built when I was hired. It was still in- <laughs> still in building phase. Um, yes, so that's who I am. And the reason I'm there, I'm at Ashbrook is because we have continued to stay progressive. Um, we have the resources to stay progressive and um, we, have, we have a great facility. We have small classroom sizes. There's just a, a lot of things that really hit home for me um, for success for these children. Thank you, Vicki. Hi, um, I'm Charlene. I'm the second grade teacher. Um, so what I've been here for four years and I previously taught for eight years in the public school system. What initially brought me to Ashbrook was the small class sizes, but what has kept me here um, not only is the relationship that I've been able to build with all the families and the different students, but also as a teacher, the freedom to be a professional and be able to make decisions based on my students, not based on a curriculum that I need to follow to the letter. Thank you. Uh, Charlene is also the team leader uh, for uh, lower school and Vicki didn't mention that she is also the team leader for beginning school. So these are school leaders aside from being classroom leaders are also leaders of their peers um, and their colleagues in their division. And I'm Kim Phillips. I teach kindergarten at Ashbrook. It's also my fourth year there, uh, my ninth year teaching. And I have stayed at Ashbrook all this time because um, the kids just come in so excited about learning. And I think that's, um, I really give credit to the families. Uh, families choose us because they value education. And so that, that culture of education and its importance gets instilled in the kids. So they come in to me just so eager to learn. And I just feel really supported by, um, by all the families and, and the colleagues and everything as well. Thank you, Kim. Um, I guess, Charlene, if you could maybe take this one. Uh, what's the, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the parts of our program that distinguish us from more typical early grades education. Yeah, so um, some of the things that distinguish Ashbrook um, are, are um, extra classes that students go to. So five days a week, students get to go to PE um, in grades K through four. Um, and you can see there on the slide that there we have a rock wall, we have a plethora of equipment, we have small class sizes. So students aren't just running around haphazardly, they're playing really targeted games with a teacher who is taking the time to teach them not just the rules of a game, but also like how to lose gracefully and how to work as a team. Um, students also go to a foreign language five days a week for 25 minutes. Um, they're put on a, diff a track when they enter kindergarten. So they're either put on a French track, a Chinese track or a Spanish track. Um, and we know that the earlier a foreign language is introduced, um, students are more receptive to it at a younger age. So it makes sense to start it in kindergarten versus high school. Um, students are also taught a new culture. They learn about a different country as well as learning the new language. And then the last specialist they go to every day 
is either 50 minutes of music or 50 minutes of art. Um, and it's not just what, what really drew me in um, coming from other schools was it wasn't just art like painting every day or coloring every day. They're building um, with clay. They're, they're doing like wax sculpture stuff. They build other things out of paper, three-dimensional things. Um, they oftentimes have stories go along with their art. So it's not just one part of art. The same thing with music. It's not just singing. It's playing different instruments. It's learning about composers. It's learning about rhythm. So it's tapping into that more creative side of a student. Um, so that I think is something that really distinguishes us um, from typical area public schools. You know, and it's important to mention that in the last six or seven years, 80% of schools in this country have cut athletics and arts programs. We've added, we've added, uh, and which I'm, which I'm super proud of. It's one of the reasons I uh, fell in love with this place as well. Um, thank you, Charlene. Vicki, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of preschool? You know, when I was, uh, when I had my own children who were all, they're in college now, they're on the other side of the spectrum. Preschool was not a thing. Like in this country, we really weren't talking about, uh, say, mandatory preschool in the public system or um, financial aid for families for preschool. It wasn't considered such an important thing. What What is, could you talk a little bit about the value of it that you see? Sure. Well, it used to be that there was like a soft start to going into kindergarten. And now we're kind of seeing that there's a playful, useful way to have a soft start going into kindergarten so that they can manage, learn early skills to be successful. Um, they develop early social, emotional, academic skills on a developmental level. And this supports their transition and into the next phase of their um, learning process. Um, it's been recognized that children that have a strong preschool background are better equipped for that structure and what's expected of them in the next in the next term great great i really i i wish my children had it i, I say this all the time i wish my children i want to regret about the school is that my children are timed out uh i would love uh, for my kids to have to have come to this school and certainly to have had preschool that's for sure uh thank you vicky kim um what can Ashbrook do for my child who is coming into kindergarten uh, already as a strong reader or maybe not yet reading at all? Yeah, I see parents worrying about that sometimes um, when their child is at one end or another of the spectrum in terms of abilities in any subject, but reading is one of them that people tend to worry about. And I really don't worry about that at all. I just kind of celebrate where they're at and celebrate their growth. So if they are still learning to identify letters when they come into me, that's just great. And we grow from there. Um, if they are, have already picked up a chapter book or two and read through them and um, they just love reading so much, we celebrate that. So um, we look for growth wherever wherever they are. And I, I teach in all kinds of different ways. So I teach in whole groups, I teach in small groups, I teach individually um, throughout the day. So everybody's getting what they need and everybody grows from wherever they are at when they get to me. And how many kids do you currently have in your class? This year I have 12. Okay. Um, that's a wonderful space too. I think about uh, when I was in kindergarten, I had, uh, I had 35 kids in my kindergarten class. I don't remember much about my education K through 12, to be honest, but I do remember Mrs. Costanza. Um, she, <laughs> and uh I, I'm sure she's no longer with us. She was about 150 years old then. And um, I just remember how kind she was, but I just remember how hard it was with all of those kids in the class. And I even, I, I guess I was overly empathetic um, as a child, but I, I remember her trying so hard to work with a large group of kids. And with 11, every time I walk into your classroom, uh, the kids are always engaged, always working on something. It's clear you know all the kids. Uh, we say all the time, there's no back row at Ashbrook. There really isn't. Um, I could uh, I could spend my whole day in your classroom and I may do that if I have another day like I had today. <laughs> yeah, and with, with just 12 or even up to 16 kids, it's, it's just, it's a lot more relaxed. I think the kids feel more relaxed, the teachers feel more relaxed and, and we can get a lot more done because we're not dealing with too much nonsense. And just to note, Ms. Phillips has the largest 
plus room in the lower school. <laughs> yeah, I do. Thanks to Vicki who helped design that. <laughs> nice. Flex, flex in our large classroom. <laughs> um, Charlene, how do you, you know, we think about uh, mathematics. That's a big question too, aside from reading. Um, how do you cultivate a passion for mathematics in, in the lower grades? Yeah, sure. So the way that we cultivate um, a love for math, it starts with the teachers. All of us teachers love math. We don't shy away from going to professional development for math. In fact, this summer we got so excited because they were offering professional development online and we got together and we did it. <laughs> so we, love, we love talking about math. We love getting students excited about it. We have an after school math club that's run by our third grade teacher. So it starts with the teacher. But on top of that, we meet students where they need to be with math. So it's not overly frustratingly hard or overly frustratingly easy. And how we do that is K through two, we do a lot of dif differentiation. We don't, like I said earlier, one of the things that brought me here was not, was that I didn't have to be like married to my curriculum. And when I go to differentiate and when kindergarten and first, second, third, fourth, when we go to differentiate, we are we are able to look outside of our curriculum to find what we need for an individual student or for a group of students. K2, we keep them in our classes. By third grade, we start to look at, does the student, is the student um, excelling enough that they would be better served in the uh, one grade above or two grades above? And when we look at that, we don't just look at, does the kid, can the kid memorize quickly? Because I think a lot of times, Something that happens is a kid's told they're really good at math because they can memorize. They're put up a level or two, and then all of a sudden math is super hard because maybe we push them up too quickly. So we look and make sure that students are ready by making sure that they understand the math, that they can explain the math, that they can write about it, that they can talk about the why, like why they're doing something, not just that they know they have to multiply in this problem. So those things are all six setting kids up for a success in math. But also when we, when we teach math, it's not just here's a lesson, here's a worksheet. There's lots of games. We have tons of manipulatives. We have iPads at our disposal for online games and online um, manipulatives. We do lots of, um, it's, we change it up a lot. So sometimes we'll be doing groups, sometimes we'll be doing whole groups, sometimes we're playing a game, sometimes they're making a game. So we try to instill that love by not making it dry and boring and just a worksheet um, day after day. Did I answer your question fully? I feel like I'm doing no, an you, interview. You, Did I answer no, your question? You, yeah. you totally, you totally did. That's that's great. Um, you know, one of the reasons I love doing these panels. Um, I didn't mention this to uh, parents who are on the line currently, but I uh, this is my first year at Ashbrook, and so I'm still learning a lot about it, and so I love listening to you talk about math just now. That was amazing. I've been in classrooms where, uh, uh, you know, and, and yes, let's just go back a moment to that deeper conceptual understanding rather than just procedural knowledge, right? And um, being able to assess children, it's it's sometimes a challenge to say to parents, you know, we understand that that your child knows, has memorized and has knowledge of this mathematical concept. They don't understand this mathematical concept. It does take a lot of parent education. Um, and I find that our parents come out of those conversations really with a lot of gratitude, right? Because we teased apart the difference between memorization and being able to do a worksheet and a deeper foundational understanding, right, of, of conceptual knowledge. Now, okay. oh, sorry. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I will say that, you know, by third grade, students can start moving into a different grade if they test into it. But that doesn't mean that differentiation stops there. Like within the grade level, still there's differentiation. It's not right. like, oh, you know, you only get the differentiation if you move to a different grade level. Within each grade level, we still differentiate. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that. It's differentiation, though, with a smaller group and a more homogeneous group. It's not differentiation yeah. in three different levels yeah. with, 30, with 30 kids in the class, which which could really be a challenge. Um, I don't I was, know how it's done. I was actually saying the other day to a friend of mine in public school, um, I was prepping for a new math unit and I had, I think, four different groups going, but only for 12 kids. So there's like three kids in each of my little groups. 
And I said, it's funny, it's the same number of groups I would have in public school, but in public school, each of those targeted groups had, you know, seven or eight kids in it. And that becomes not so targeted because there's seven or eight kids still. So mm -hmm. just being able to have less kids in each group, you can just do so much more and you can just push that group so much further. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I love uh, watching kids come up with alternative algorithms even. And that to me really speaks to understanding. Like if you can put together an algorithm and talk about it with, you know, deep understanding about coming to an answer in a different yeah. way. To me that I've really appreciated watching that in our classrooms, lower school and, uh, and middle school classrooms. Um, well, going on to say what Ms. Phillips said too, and going with Ms. Ulrich, um, we were able to differentiate the instruction in almost all subject areas. And, that, and that's really, really important and really nice to see that we're able mm -hmm. to do that. Kim, anything about mathematics in kindergarten that we should spend some time talking about? Um, well, yeah, I just like to think about um, previous generations, how, how we were taught math sometimes was like the drill and kill method. Um, and I think that it sort of like is the reason why a lot of people think, oh, I'm bad at math or I hate math or it's so boring. It, but it really is. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was just the wrong way to teach it, just to have kids repeat the same procedure again and again and not necessarily necessarily care about understanding and understanding why they were doing what they were doing. So I think it's really important that my students understand the why behind it um, and have multiple methods for accomplishing the same thing. So maybe they can show their work on a number line and also write an equation. Maybe they could use manipulatives like objects to show how it works, uh, explain it to a, someone that's not understanding as well. Imagine you're, you're teaching a pre k -er how to do this. We do that kind of thing. So some deeper level understanding of math. Uh, I'm not so keen on just memorizing a procedure. That's not really what I'm going for. I really want them to understand. So that's kind of my perspective on the math. I think that's a great perspective to have. Thank you so much. Um, shifting a little bit from, from academics, um, Charlene, could you talk a little bit uh, about how we build relationships with our with our students. Those relationships are so important. Uh, I mean, that's how children learn. They learn through relationships. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the time and effort we put into that and how we go about doing that at Ashbrook? Yeah, so we get the opportunity to build relationships in several different ways here at Ashbrook. Um, one of my favorite is that um, all teachers have four, at, we have four recess duties per week. So we have two morning recess duties and two afternoon recess duties. So not only are we seeing our students in the class, but we get to go out with all the K through fourth graders. So some students that I'm gonna have in the future, some students that I've had in the past, and we actually get to interact with them out at recess. And that is so much fun. We get to see how they're interacting with each other, which then sometimes gives us a little insight on what's going on in our classroom sometimes but also it, gets, it gives us an opportunity and them an opportunity to come and chat with us. It's so nice for my, like the third and fourth graders that I had the last couple of years to come up and say, hi, oh, how's it going? Oh, what are you learning about right now? Oh, hey, you got bunnies, you know, three weeks ago. How are they doing? Or when you were in my class, you had just gotten a puppy. How's that puppy doing? Um, so it just helps them know that they're seen and that they are part of a community. Um, it also allows me to start building that relationship with the kindergartners and the first graders so that by the time they get into my class, I have a little background knowledge on them and I can talk and interact with them in a way that I couldn't if they were just stepping through my door on the first day and I'd never met them. We also get to eat lunch with our students, which I will say when I first was hired here and I was told I had to eat lunch with my students, I was like, that is not a selling point. Um, however, <laughs> however, I will say after like two days, I was like, yeah, I get why this is a selling point. So pre-COVID, we would all eat in the cafeteria together. Um, on one of the previous slides, you saw what our cafeteria was. You probably didn't realize it was a cafeteria because it doesn't look like a normal cafeteria. Um, huge windows, big ceilings. Um, we all sit together and it's a great opportunity to chat with kids. You learn a lot about their lives. Um, I can remember one time chatting with a student over lunch later that day we're writing and they could not come up with a topic and I was like hey you were just telling me that you got a new kitten why don't we write about your new kitten so it just kind of starts building that relationship together that then you can 
bring into the classroom. It also is a great time to teach um, manners at the table, which is always really fun. How you know you sit on your bottom, you talk to who you're next to. Can I um, can I add to that a little bit, Charlene? Yeah. It, it might seem like that's just a bunch of added duties on the teacher, like, oh, well, they're already teaching all those things and they have to do recess and lunch too. But um, think back to how we were talking about how we had all those special classes. We have PE, we have foreign language, we have art and music. So there's our prep time right there. We still have plenty of time to prepare awesome lessons. And I don't feel like we're overloaded because we also go out to recess and, and sit with our kids at lunch and all of that. Exactly. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, one more way we develop um, relation, strong relationships with students is our buddy days. So the lower school K through four is buddied with a middle school class, which is a mixture of fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And once a month we get together, I think you can see a picture there. This is a, a picture from COVID time. So we were really spread apart. Um, and we do an activity and the activity is based on the um, character trait of the month. Um, and so we'll get together and we'll chat about it and then we'll do um, an activity. And sometimes if we have time and we have time left over after our activity, then we'll just, you know, we'll play a, a game of tag or anything um, to, to have the kids playing together. And it's fun for the kids to build that community. Like the other day we were walking down the hallway and I kid you not, all my students started talking behind me and we we're usually silent. And it was because one of the middle schoolers that was in the hallway at their locker was one of our big buddies and they just couldn't get, oh, that was just, that made their day. Um, we also build that relationship with our lower school um, and the preschool and pre-K. So my second grade class buddies with Vicky's pre-K class mm -hmm. um, and we do an activity as well once a month. And that it's really a wonderful time um, to be able to interact as an adult with those pre-Kers, but also to see my second graders and the pre-Kers interact together. So just adding to that a little bit about our, our interactions um, for Buddy Day, it, it, seemed, it enhances children's cooperative learning experience, such as taking turns, listening, sharing knowledge and skills, and supporting and encouraging each other. Um, the older, older students experience pride in their ability to do something, and then and their helpfulness and the younger ones enjoy the attentiveness and 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 just being with someone they just look up to them they kind of just worship them um so we really 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 cherish our buddy day and it's just like she said it's it, we walk by them and they're just like oh there's my buddy um and, and it's just wonderful to see so it's twofold um, for each it's twofold for each uh, group in just in different ways. I'm uh, I'm amazed at how on fire the upper school and middle school kids are about buddy days. Um, I've been, this is the fourth school, hopefully the last school where I'll be. And I uh, have, we've tried buddy days. We've tried that sort of uh, pairing and it's never worked. And when I, to be honest, when I first heard about it, when this job opportunity came on my radar, I thought, okay, buddy days, you know, everybody's got buddy days. Um, you know, there's a big difference between the plan and the sort of theory of how it'll work and how it ends up working. But uh, the photographs that you see here are from several different buddy days where I walked around with a camera uh, and posted a lot of these on Instagram. Um, and it is just amazing how focused the upper school kids are on I mean we know that the lower school kids idolize the upper school kids right they really do they're they want to be like them but the upper school kids take such responsibility uh and you can see some of these photographs the earnestness in the eyes of the upper school students speaking to the lower school kids um and they're speaking to them, to them about the character trait which is so powerful for me uh to be able to hear them give a lesson on the character trait, right? Um, there's a there's a saying um, that to, to teach it once is to learn it twice, right? And and I really do believe that that works uh, in this case as well, that, uh, you know, even if the upper school kids don't always, you know, act in a way that's 100% in keeping with the character trait, it's in there, right? And they'll be able to call on it sometime in the future when we're not around. Right. And that voice will be in their head. I'm absolutely confident of that. Um, so I really I really do love the buddy days and think that this is a program that we should probably 
talk more about because not a lot of schools are able to execute on this. Um, here's a, a final question and I'm gonna go to, we'll see if there are any questions from our, from our parents, but I'm wondering um, why did all of you want to be a teacher in the first place? Can you, this is a question for all of you. Can you all kind of jump in there? Like what motivated you? What were you think? What, what were you thinking? That's what I was gonna just say. Well, I think we all have in common that we have a love of kids. We, we yeah. really thoroughly enjoy being around them and, and they're, they're just, it's a, mar a marvel to see that what, they, what they're capable of doing. Um, I, I, I like to just see kids grow into their best selves, not to be a certain thing, but just to be the best little person they can be. Um, not trying to change personality or have too much expectation, but just to, to just let them be the best, best little self they can be. And we can visibly see it that happen. So it's, it's really kind of, it's just heart, you know, breaks, it doesn't break my heart, but it makes my heart full that you can actually visibly see the growth in these, these students. Uh, can I interrupt just, I know I, I, I asked a question, I asked you all to answer, and now I'm going to jump in here. Kim, you had said something the other day when we were talking that really impressed me. You had said, uh, kind of riffing off what Vicki just said, uh, these students, it's like in the lower school, it's like they're all my students. Um, I'll see a fourth grader and uh, it's like you still consider them your student, right? They came through your class. And um, could you talk a little bit about, about that? I was really impressed with that. Um, sure. Yeah, I've been at Ashbrook four years now. And so even the third graders feel like they're still my students. And I'd say that about any student I've ever had. There's a few students running around in high school now. I just got a text from an old student that um, he's got his learner's permit now. And it's a little bit shocking well, and scary, but he's still good. mine. <laughs> yeah. That's really so, scary. Yeah. But here at Ashbrook, I mean, they're all my students. They were in my class once. So they're still mine. Um, there you go. It feels like that. Well, and they still come back. I mean, we yeah. just had some alumni come back all the time. Um, to see us. And, and that's just a testament to what we're doing, uh, hopefully, successfully. Well, I will also mention here that at Corvallis High School, the four grades of student presidents are all Ashbrook graduates, uh, which is important to keep in mind. And one of them was in my office the other day, uh, pitching a joint uh, Corvallis High School Ashbrook uh, fundraiser, uh, which was great. She just walked into my office and felt she could do that. And, I just love that, right? They can always come back. They're alumni. That means a lot. It really does. Um, so I interrupted. So I'm going to now go back to my original question about why, you know, why did you choose teaching? Well, I wasn't always a teacher. I intended to be a scientist. <laughs> I, I moved to Corvallis to finish my master's in entomology. And <laughs> I just, I've, I have, I've always had kids in my life, um, I'm the oldest out of many, many cousins, and I was always babysitting kids, and my mom ran a daycare out of my house. So um, science wasn't exciting enough. <laughs> it wasn't a challenge enough for me. I loved learning about science, but I missed kids. So I, as soon as I finished my master's, I went on and, and got a teaching degree so I could go back and work with kids. And so, of course, I love teaching science, but mostly I, I just love working with the kids and seeing them grow and seeing them learn. And that I'm reminded of that science connection that, you know, from time to time, uh, you and our upper school science teacher connect on curriculum and uh, there's a there's a sense of sequence eventually, right? Like if you're going to if you're going to do something different or you're you're trying something out in kindergarten, the woman who teaches eighth grade science and seventh grade science and sixth grade science you know, all the grades in the middle school, she has a connection with you, right? And so you can understand a scope and sequence. Nobody's doing anything because we have autonomy, because to Charlene's point, we are not uh, slavishly sort of wed to a curriculum uh, that's delivered from the state. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't coordinate our efforts. It doesn't mean that we don't have conversations about curriculum across and between uh, discipline teachers, which I think is is just fabulous. But I know that uh, Roseanne Steckler, who's the upper school science teacher, really values uh, her her conversations with you. So way to go. Good on you. 
So I became a teacher. Um, originally, I went into teaching to teach math, middle school math. Um, part of the reason I went into math was my dad was a math teacher and he instilled a love for math in me. Um, and partly because at the beginning of school years, when you felt those little like getting to know you posters, I always got so offended when kids would put their least favorite subject was math. I was like, what's going on here? I think math is the best. Um, and so my original drive to be a teacher was to teach math, to instill that love for math. And I went with middle school versus high school. Just, I wanted to teach middle school. Um, but then I, the way that the certificate is, you have to get certified in elementary too. And I spent like one day in an elementary room student teaching. I was like, I'm going to elementary school because I loved having the same kids all day long. Like I love teaching math, but I love building that relationship. Even in a public school when it was 30 kids, I loved, they were my students. We were a family and we were together all day and we got to, I got to really get to know them. And then I, I learned to love to teach reading and writing and science and social studies. Um, but if you're in my class, students know my, the thing I say the most is, oh, this is my favorite math lesson, which becomes kind of a little bit of a running joke because every math lesson is my favorite, so. Um, you know, it's important, I think, to mention that um, as we're talking about this, that fifth grade in a lot of schools is considered, um, you know, part of the elementary program, but our uh, our fifth grade is part of the middle school. Can you talk a little bit, can anybody on the, uh, any of the teachers talk about the value of that uh, fifth grade year being a middle school year? I can go ahead and talk about that because when I taught in public school, I taught fifth grade. Um, what I, something that when I taught in public school that my teaching partner and I were very adamant about was fifth grade, like this is your transition year. And we already were starting to treat them like middle schoolers. So I love that when I came here, we actually have done that here at Ashbrook. They're in a slightly different part of the building. They're not in the lower school hall. They're not in the middle school hall. They're kind of in the middle. Um, they do part, part of the time they're with their homeroom teacher, but they also get to go out and explore some of those, um, some of those other classes in electives. Um, and I just, I like, I love how Ashbrook, they took something that I have been saying for years that fifth grade, they are no longer, they are no longer primary students. These are almost middle schoolers. We need to treat them that way. We need to start teaching them that responsibility. And they just sort of took that to the next level. I mean, when I walked in here and they said, oh, the fifth grade is kind of the, in, you know, in between the lower school and the middle school hallways. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I've been saying for years. So I just think it's really important, kind of like Vicky was talking about that have pre-K as the soft start into kindergarten. Fifth grade is that transition year into middle school. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Again, it's one of those things I've been at, at, really at some of the best schools in the country that have tried to do that and they haven't been able to pull it off. So I was really, really delighted. It was another reason I sort of fell in love with this place. You know, as you look around and you, you see the program, I, I mentioned earlier the architecture, how you know, everything's purpose built. Like there's a, you could point to anything in this building and we can talk about why it's that way, right? It, it does form truly follows function is the way Dave designed this building. It's the same way with the curriculum and, and say the academic schedule, everything makes sense, right? There's a, there's a certain logic that, that went into building it. And if we ask the question and we can't answer like, you know, why was it done this way? We can't answer it that way. It's a great opportunity to maybe dig into it a little bit and, and explore other ways of doing things, right? I love the fact that fifth grade is, you know, she's, you know, she, I'm speaking about Amanda Kelly as, a, as the teacher has her self-contained room, but those kids get out a little bit more and, you know, they walk around with a little swagger, I have to say. Um, <laughs> um, it's just, they feel, you could see that they, they feel like bigger kids, right? And, uh, but they're still, the safety net is still there. It's just disappearing, right? A little bit every day. Yeah. Um, well, Thank you um, to everybody who, uh, to the teachers who took the time to answer these these questions. I'm wondering uh, if we could shift now to uh, talking a little bit about uh, maybe questions that the parents have, maybe questions that are in the chat. I haven't checked the chat. I suppose I should check that. There's no uh, questions in the chat. No questions in the chat. Do parents are? Do any of the parents online have any questions for our panelists? Um, it's not so much a question, but just a little bit of curiosity about the parent education that you mentioned. So we have 
one daughter, and we're pretty much figuring out this parenting thing. <laughs> Each step of the way. We obviously you didn't get the that. you didn't get the owner's man you didn't get the owner's manual, Mark. I, I, I've Googled for it and uh, I still haven't found anything satisfactory. <laughs> but you know what we are looking for are excellent educators such as yourself who can provide us with a little bit of guidance on how we can best support our kids' education. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy at this, uh, as being a man of a certain age, um, having raised three children myself and thousands of other people's children, is that uh, I, I find that parents really enjoy uh, conversations about, uh, say, developmental psychology or, uh, you know, uh, being able to understand who their child is relative to so sort of normative curves, right? And or being able to talk to their children about topical issues that are important. You know, how do I talk to my children about a school shooting? How do I talk to my children about issues around Black Lives Matter and diversity, equity, inclusion? How do I talk to them about, um, you know, something that happened nationally that, that uh, made the news that they happened to see? Uh, what is the, you know, what is the school's thinking on social media, right? And, and how many, how much screen time my child should get? Um, one of the things I do is the last Friday of every month is I publish an article uh, for parents that really is aimed specifically at those issues, um, topical issues, whether they be topical national issues um, or issues that are occurring in our school or in our county, um, you know, to be able to, and I, and I, find I get a lot of really great responses from parents who, who um, you know, are really appreciative of because they're going through this for the first time. If I can give them the benefit of my experience, having gone through it and maybe botched it a couple of times with my own children, um, you know, being able to pay forward some of the wisdom that I got from people as I asked for advice. Um, that, that parent education, I think, is, I'm, I'm at that age now where uh, I, can, I can share that information and, and people, and, and, you know, maybe it's the gray beard, I don't know, but, but people are, uh, I think very appreciative and very open to those uh, to those conversations. I also learn a great deal from uh, still uh, still learn a great deal from uh, our parents who are on the other side of the spectrum for up from where I am. Um, there's a lot of sort of new thinking out there about raising children, um, and I'm always keeping my my eyes open for that as well to be able to learn and and temper you know, what I think of as wisdom that I've earned through the years of raising my children, temper that with the new information that I'm getting from some of our parents, uh, new perspectives on things that I hadn't thought about. Um, anybody else on the, on the call? Well, yeah, to... I'd like to address that a little bit. Um, I think that something that helps with kind of parenting questions or, or behavioral concerns that come up with the kids is that everybody drops off and picks up their children. We don't, since we don't have a bus system for better or worse we do have a better connection with our families because we see someone from that family twice a day so it's really easy to just have a quick informal conversation it's like hey i'm seeing this behavior are you seeing this at home what works for you i tried this that kind of thing and it's not really such a, like a, a formal parenting class but it's just a really open um, communication so we can kind of touch base on on things and see what works and what doesn't and get share ideas that kind of thing and, and we really welcome the communication with parents. Our parents are a big part of our lives as well as a, as a student. So we we're that that's a huge part. That communication with the family is is huge to the kid, child's success. We uh, oh, go ahead, Charlie. Sorry. I'll just say one one last thing on that. Um, because we do have such small class sizes, and because we do do the drop off and the pickup. It is so easy, like Kim said, to stop and chat with a parent and nothing really, how do I say this? No, nothing gets put off. Like the parent is there, I'm gonna talk to them. Hey, and sometimes it's academic. Sometimes it's, hey, you know, I noticed today in class that they were really struggling with this. You know, would you mind working on this at home tonight? Or we're gonna keep an eye on this, you know, this, you know, spelling, you know, with, you know, um, E at the end to make the vowel say its name, right? This little phonics pattern. They're having trouble with this. I'm gonna watch it in class. Can you watch at home when they're doing some writing? Let me know what you see. And I may have some activities for you to do to kind of boost what they're doing in class. Well, so I, I kind of fumbled there. 
so socially we do that same thing so they'll go home and they'll say nobody wants to play with me <laughs> and so we 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 watch that a little more closely and make sure we gather some information and then we um relay that to the parent i often take pictures um of that so they, they they're reassured that their child isn't is having a great time because <laughs> they are yeah. And, and a lot of it's and a lot of it's parallel play at that age anyway, right? So it's uh, I remember when I was uh, the very first day I saw my daughter out at the playground. I, I I walked up by the playground like this. I just wanted to see that she was playing with somebody else. And gosh forbid, if she wasn't, then she was going to live a life of loneliness, and I was doomed. <laughs> Even knowing everything I say to parents about parallel play, I still was a victim uh, of it myself. Um, it's uh, interesting to hear you to hear you talk about uh, the partnership with parents. It's something that's super important to me. I'm out at the uh, curb every single day at drop off and pick up. And I spend a lot of time talking to parents. These are moments where they have access to me uh, as head of school. Um, I don't work directly. I do teach one class in the upper school. Um, I don't end up speaking to parents a lot about that class, um, but I do spend a lot of time getting to know kids in the, in the lower school. Um, which is really, really important to me um, because, and, and I love it when they see me in the hallway and they say, hey, doc, how are you? I, I think it, it's such a great feeling for me, but I think being able to connect with them in that way is, is really important to me. And I, I think parents know that I'm really trying hard, even with all the masks, to know the kids. Um, and, and that's important, I think, to them, as, to them as well, especially as we're dispensing wisdom in, in parent education. It's good for them to know that I know their kids. Um, that's super important. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question um, from the parents. Anybody on the on the Zoom? Um, hi, so I'm curious about the after school um, program at the lower school level, and if there is uh, any uh, summer program available at Ashbrook. Um, uh, who wants to take the after school question? I can take after school. I was just with them today. If that's okay with Vicky and Kim. Um, so for after school, right, um, we have for kindergarten through fourth grade, they're a group, so they go to aftercare together. Um, it's currently, it's in our library, and they have a little bit of a schedule for aftercare. So the first half hour, they come in, they settle in, they can have a snack, and they work on homework, and it's kind of a quiet time. Um, and then they go out to the playground from 3.30 to 4, and they get to play, and then they come back in. And a lot of times by that point, a lot of kids are getting picked up. So there's kind of a transition there. Um, and then at that point, um, at, at the four o'clock time, um, there's lots of games in there. Obviously, there's, there's books because it's the library. So you can always read. But I've been in there several times filling in for the teacher. And there's lots of games to play. And I always, I'm always in interacting with them because I know that she, the other teacher, always does. So playing lots of games and just sitting and talking. Or there's educational games. There's board games. There's card games. Um, and so that's that's what uh, after school looks like. I won't I won't talk about summer because I'm not, I don't know I can, much. About I can talk camp. a little bit about summer camp because I started it way back in the day. There you go. <laughs> and um, it, it's a, it's a great program. It's thematically um, put together um, with a lot of fun time, um, but still some a little bit of learning, some kind of science and math or whatever. And um, it's it's offered it's, it's evolved and it's still evolving. Um, so we haven't quite defined what it is for the summer, but I'm sure there'll be a summer program and we're actually having a meeting tomorrow to discuss how to make that even a richer program. So yes, we do offer a summer camp and it's a great program in a great facility in a great space. We have uh, uh, that meeting tomorrow. Thanks, Vicki, for mentioning that. We will publish a brochure with our summer offerings uh, in March or April um, and our going to be building on, I think, a very successful program. Thank you, Vicki, for starting that. Um, and uh, you use the word evolve. I think we're going to evolve to the point where we're going to have, um, you know, a, a really rich array of alternatives for parents to choose for uh, from for the summer. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that meeting and publishing that brochure. But uh, the space is remarkable. The physical plant, uh, 12 and a half acres. We've got three soccer fields. We've got two playgrounds. We've got tennis courts. Um, you know, if I had it my way, I'd be out there with a shovel digging a digging in the ground, put a pool in, uh, maybe in the future as a vision, who knows, but it's such a great space for a summer camp. Um, 
And uh, so we're looking forward to uh, you know, launching a few more programs and really providing a very rich array of, of alternatives for parents. Um, I'm going we, to. We have, sewing, we have a sewing room and a theater. So yeah. we have a sewing room and a theater and um, just a lot of things that you would know that's that's there that we can tap into for a good program well, for the summer. A wonderful. Also, I think it's important. Uh, and maybe if people stick around on the tour, I can show this if the lights are on. Uh, the, uh, the theater is really a professional caliber theater. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time originally from New York. So I spent a lot of time on Broadway, not on stage, uh, as the audience. And so I've spent a lot of time in theaters and I can tell you that this, this theater is, uh, as, as good a theater as anything I've seen off Broadway, really, really amazing. The Gores designed it. As you drive up to this building, you will see as maybe the most prominent feature of the architecture, uh, the set tower. Uh, and all of our sets are stored up there, right? It's a two-story tower uh, that, that sort of looms above the stage itself. Stage is actually, uh, the theater is actually four stories, uh, one under the stage, the stage, and then two stories above it. Um, behind it is the uh, costume design studio that Vicki was just talking about. Adjacent to that is the set design studio, which is filled with all manner of woodworking tools and all of our sets that can be wheeled in, created by the kids and wheeled in, uh, costumes created by the kids and, you know, uh, in both the plays in the lower school and uh, the big boy and girl plays that uh, we put on on, on the stage uh, for, the, for the community. So uh, very exciting uh, and the role of arts plays such an important role for everything we do here. And, and it was an important part of what the Gores, as I said earlier, what the Gores designed. Um, if there's nothing else for the moment, um, I will, in, to honor the time uh, and to make sure that we uh, all get to the things that we have left on our plate for the day, I want to thank the teachers after working a full day. Uh, Charlene, I see you're still down the hall in your classroom, which is amazing. Yep. There's there's no internet at my house, so I had to be... <laughs> you're, tra you're trapped by the Wi-Fi. Oh, but Kim and Vicki, thank you very, very much for taking the time. All of our parents on the line, again, thank you for trusting us with your time. Uh, there is my information on the screen. Uh, if you've not copied it down yet, you have about another minute to do that. Um, please reach out. That's my personal cell phone. Uh, talk or text. I'd be happy to talk with you about the program uh, and help you fall in love with the program the way I have uh, fallen in love with the program. With that said, I will bid you good night and hopefully get a chance to meet some of you uh, parents face to face at some point in the future. Thank you very much. If you want to stick around for a tour, uh, I'll, you know, just stay on the call and I'll walk around with my laptop. It's up to you. I'm not offended if nobody wants to take a tour, though. Believe me, um, it's I'm not sure I could do it justice. You really should show up and and see this beautiful, beautiful building. But if you want, I'll give you a tour. OK, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.